So let me start by saying I'm type 1 diabetic, uh, stress-induced when I was 32 years old. So I have a service dog here who is um, currently letting me know that she's upset that she's actually in her crate. So hopefully she won't interrupt us. Um, but I tell you for a couple of reasons. Number one, if I start babbling, which has happened, stop it. Someone give me a glass of orange juice. You stop. You stop or everyone's going to laugh at you. Um, here's the other thing. I got type 1 diabetes when I was 32 within two weeks of telling my husband I wanted a divorce. Also, I suspect, and my doctor agrees, because at the same time, it was two weeks before Christmas, one of the most stressful times of the year, right? And I was in litigation in federal court, which is always more stressful than state court, um, and I was making new law, which was something that was a goal that I had set for myself to make new, <laughs> make new law. Thank you, sir. I won't know if I'm babbling. I have to tell you. You'll have to say, Jorn, have some orange juice. Yeah, and she's locked up, so she can't do anything. Um, so, so let's start with the understanding that divorce uh, has has affected nearly everyone in this room adversely somehow, either you or your, or someone close to you has been divorced and you've suffered the ill effects of that. Um, divorce is, in my opinion, the most stressful event, event that can happen in someone's life. They tell you that, oh, by the way, interrupt if you want to, um, they tell you that uh, death is the most stressful event. Guess what, folks? Divorce is death. Death of a relationship and then pile on top of that, um, hi, pile, pile on top of that, uh, the fact that um, well over 50% of all marriages that end in divorce also end in relocation for at least one of the spouses. Especially these days, more than half of the, more than, it, it's not just one spouse will be moving out, quite often it's both, because the one that's left can't afford to stay there. So you've got relocation, which is one of those top stressful events. Um, and yet, well over 50% of all marriages end in divorce. 50% of first marriages, 67% of second marriages, 73% of third marriages. I know you guys like numbers. A lot of you like numbers. Um, end in divorce. I argue that the reason those statistics go up is because no one learns anything the first time they get divorced. Do they, Paul? They come back to court time after time after. Well, it's not true. What they learn when they, when they go to court is how to go to court. That's what they learn. And then you see them come, come back, come back, come back. Um, the type of divorce that I'm promoting, and we have a couple of other promoters in the room with us, which is very nice, is um, courtless. Every divorce, you got to go to court. Every divorce, you got to get a judge to give you a final judgment. I remember when um, I went to an attorney for my divorce. I was not a divorce lawyer. I was a commercial lawyer. Um, I went to an attorney and I said, I need to get a divorce. And he goes, fine, I'll file a petition. And I stepped back and my jaw hit the floor and I said, whoa, wait a second. You have to go to court to get divorced? I don't have to go to court to get married. What are you, what are you talking about? And he explained to me that, yeah, and this was before mediation had become even something that was a possibility. So I went to court. I actually uh, settled out of court. We, we used to call it that. It was not mediation. It was um, cooperative. But um, it was still very stressful, and I ended up with diabetes. I remember the last thing my husband said to me was, no one will want to marry you. So it was cooperative, but it wasn't nice. Um, and, uh, and now I've been married 21 years, just in case you were wondering. <laughs> And the stepdaughter I have is the light of my life. So my name is Joran Jenkins. Um, I have 35 years of experience in the courtroom. During that time, I've published extensively. Um, I have a book called War or Peace, Avoid the Destruction of Divorce Court. I also have a book called I Never Saw My Father Again, uh, The Divorce Court Effect. I've received an award given only in the Supreme Court of the United States, once a year to one person. Um, Divorce is terrifying. It's a terrifying thing. There's so many questions. Um, what's going to happen to my kids? What's going to happen to my house? How long will it take? How much will it cost? 
We all know that one, right? I offer an alternative to traditional courtroom divorce. It takes less time, it costs less money. Um, you make the decisions, not some judge who doesn't know you, who doesn't know your children, who doesn't share your values, more importantly. And um, strangely, it protects your relationships with the people you care about, with your children, with your friends, with your neighbors, with your CPA, with your CFP, um, and, and yes, with your soon-to-be ex. The reason I feel so strongly about collaborative divorce is uh, because when I was seven years old, my parents were divorced. My mother loaded us kids into the van and moved us 3,000 miles away, and I never saw my father again. Now, here's what's shocking about that. I was at breakfast, at a networking breakfast, and I was sitting at a table with six men, pretty much in my age range. I won't share exactly how old that is. Um, and I told that story because it had become more impactful in my life. I never shared it when I was younger, but I became able to share it later. Two of the men sitting at the table told the exact same story. One never saw his mom again. I think it was eight years old. One never saw his dad again when, after he was 10. Now, in, in part, that's my generation, because we didn't have anti-relocation statutes. But, um, but not an uncommon story. And by the way, people still skip town with their kids. They still do it. And, and kids still don't see their fathers again. I don't want to see that happen to other fam fam other children, of course. But more importantly, I don't want to see that happen to other families. So I'm known in my community, I'm known by my clients for restructuring families, not uh, destroying them. So we like to say divorce without destruction. Um, if you've ever known someone who's been through the court system, uh, it's a harrowing experience and it can take years. Once you're in court, you lose control totally, and so does your spouse. And neither of you quite realizes that. Neither of the lawyers are, is in charge and the judge isn't in charge. It's kind, of a, it's kind of a three engineers on the train and they're all trying to drive the train in different directions and nobody's winning. So that's, um, that's where I'm coming from. Um, I do have a PowerPoint. Let's see if I can uh, figure out how to work it. Let's see. Um, I'm going to... Uh, do I have to turn this on, Ariel? You pointed at the... Uh, I pointed at the TV or the... At the yeah, computer? Projector. At the projector. That doesn't mean I'll... There you go. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, actually, I'm going to have to run through this pretty quickly because I've already jabbered. Um, I'm good at jabbering. Uh, we all know this. Divorce is the, and I'm standing in your way, divorce is the psychological equivalent of a triple coronary bypass. That's Mary Kay Cosmetics. Um, Ah, yes, divorce from the Latin meaning to rip out a man's genitals through his wallet. Well, he's, he's talking about courtroom divorce. Uh, by the way, Robin Williams, uh, the second time, yeah. Gene Meyer, let's be blunt. If you hire a divorce lawyer today, there's a good chance you'll hire a bankruptcy lawyer within two or three years. By the way, I practice bankruptcy also. Guess what? I cross network from my family lawyers to my bankruptcy lawyers, from my bankruptcy lawyers to me. Yeah. So, and then Craig Ferguson, divorce lawyers stoke anger and fear in their clients knowing that as long as the conflicts remain unresolved, the revenue stream will keep flowing. That's not funny. That's true. And by the way, I'm not dissing divorce lawyers. Please don't misunderstand me. We don't do it on purpose. It's called CYA. Cover my ass. If I don't file a petition that asks for alimony, and two years later, my client is impoverished and your client is still making a million bucks a year, I'm up the creek. I committed malpractice. And yet, today, my client makes a million a year and your client makes a million a year and I ask for alimony and your client gets this petition and freaks out. What the hell? She's asking for alimony from me? She was the breadwinner during most of the marriage. What's going on here? Okay, I always ask for alimony. I always ask for child support. I always ask for attorney's fees. And the other side gets this form petition, because I have to file the form petition, 
and they hit the roof. And their attorney doesn't say, calm down, it's fine, this is just the way it goes, we'll, we'll give her a call, we'll try, and, we'll try and settle this quickly and collaboratively or cooperatively or we'll go to mediate. It's not what happens. They file back their divorce petition and ask for all the same things. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. <laughs> so, um, what's collaborative divorce? Now, I can run you through all of the specifics of collaborative divorce. I don't think you really need to know that. What you need to understand is the general, uh, the big picture. So I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. Um, you kind of got most of it in my pitch, actually. Um, you've got the husband, you've got the wife, you've got husband's lawyer, you've got wife's lawyer. But here's where it, it becomes different. You've got a neutral facilitator and you've got a financial neutral. This must appeal to you folks who are financials because now you've got someone in the room who is on both parties' sides. It's not that he's on no one's side, it's on he's on the family's side. Okay, that's what's important. And this, this facilitator here usually has a mental health background. We don't say that out loud because our clients immediately say, well, I'm not mentally ill, I don't need one. We just say, that's the facilitator. This is the guardian of the process. And by the way, what's really funny about this process, this is the judge. If there is such a thing, which there isn't, but you know how in court the lawyers aren't in charge? Really? In this process, the lawyers aren't in charge. Really. I take care of my client. I'm my client's coach. I'm my client's advocate in the process. So in a really nice way, I'm still an advocate. But it's the facilitator who schedules the meetings, runs the meetings, sends out the agendas, talks to the clients either together or separately. And by the way, I don't call them parties. If you catch me saying party, um, I get a demerit. Parties are go to, those are people who go to court. Spouses are people who've been married together and who hopefully have, have children and will co-parent later on. So I call them clients or spouses. Sometimes it's the other client because it's not my client, although Sometimes it really doesn't feel that way. I just feel closer to my client. But the other client is, is the client in the room, and so I have my, I have my advocacy hat on for him too, maybe. Um, so that's the team. That's the quintessential team here in Tampa. Uh, there are different structures in California, um, but you know that's the land of fruits and nuts, and I, I don't live there. My sister lives there. Um, my daughter's moving back from California, so. Um, so that's the, that's the kernel of the team. Now, usually this financial neutral is a CPA. I say that, but I run a pro bono collaborative divorce project and I have a lot of CFPs who work on my teams. Um, pro bono. Can they work on a, on a paid case? You know better than I. Some CFPs can be paid by the hours, other, others can't. So um, yes, they can. Um, is it often? I, I'm not sure. I have had a CFP working on, on one of my paid teams, um, but it's not usual. Now, are they useful? Absolutely. Even in my pro bono cases, I had one case where I had a CPA and a CFP. We were talking Social Security. We were talking a very, very small pension. We were, but we were still talking CFP language, and we had that CFP in the room, and it was a wonderful thing. So, but usually a CPA because usually the, the financial neutral is the one who's wrangling the numbers and I probably have that further in. The problem with this PowerPoint is I tell it all at the front end and then I get to the back and I go, oh wait, I already talked about that, so. Um, but there are other people who can be in this process too. Sometimes we have a child advocate, um, another mental health person who specializes in, in, in children. Um, and we may decide that the children need a voice at the table rather than just the facilitator possibly speaking for the children. Um, so we might bring in a, in a child specialist. Um, we've brought in uh, an estate and planning attorney. Another pro bono case, uh, the parties, uh, the parties, the clients um, actually wanted to leave each other in their wills because they had children together and they wanted to make sure that everybody was happy. And so they were getting divorced but we had to bring in an estate planner to uh, redesign their wells for them and make sure that the children understood what was going on in, in our room. So we can bring in other people who aren't necessarily trained, but all these people 
the lawyers and the two neutrals have been collaboratively trained. There's a two-day introductory training that's required to call yourself a collaborative professional. I will tell you that, um, that I've had very collaborative attorneys approach me about doing a case collaboratively. And if I can make sure that the two financials are okay with that, we'll do that. Because it's sometimes the only way to get the person, the, co the divorce done collaboratively <coughs> because that lawyer was chosen by that client and we couldn't get that lawyer into a training quickly enough. We just finished a training two weeks ago. Um, <coughs> if any of you are interested, by the way, in being trained, let me know. Okay. Um, so, yeah, the problem is going through a divorce makes a person feel isolated. Um, it's, it's, it's a terrifying thing. There are so many questions. Um, we give them this team specialized training. The bottom line is the clients control the process. Now, I've said that because it's not like, the, it's not like your train wreck going to court. On the other hand, they have to do the process. They can't say, well, we're, we, don't, we don't think we need a mental health person in the room, so we're not going to have it with a facilitator. That's not really collaborative. Although, I will tell you that the real current rule and this is the crux of the matter, the lawyers have to agree not to go to court ever for those clients. We sign an agreement, it's called the Collaborative Participation Agreement, that both clients sign it, both lawyers sign it, and the one provision that is not changeable is if these clients give up on the process, if they give up on going collaborative, and I use that term, then the lawyers are fired. Now, how many of you understand the conflict of interest that every divorce lawyer has with their client? Other than you. Okay. So, I want to make money. You're my client. You want to save money. We have a conflict of interest. I do not allow clients to, to sign a retainer agreement with me sitting in my office. They're, they're coerced by being in my office, by being stressed. I tell them, go home, talk to another lawyer, talk to your mom, talk to your child. Don't sign this without reading it. Yes, it's a standard agreement, but you need to understand what you're signing. Um, so we have this conflict of interest, and many lawyers aren't aware of it, don't want to be aware of it. So. We get a client in our office. The client is uh, suffering from the most stress he's ever suffered. And he hires me, and he gives me a ten or $20,000 retainer, and I blow through that pretty quick. And then he's just paying the monthly bill. And if he doesn't pay the bill, I quit. And he's left high and dry. And that is a very coercive process. And it's not my fault. I'm the lawyer. It really isn't my fault. But that's the way it works. So we try to get them before they've gotten themselves into that process, into that litigation mindset. Um, we're not, uh, not always successful. That's one reason why I'm talking to you here today. Yes, ma'am. So, Counselor, you're saying, am I understanding then that collaborative divorce is not necessarily for the purpose of saving money? Oh, absolutely. Although, understand this. And, and we as collaborative professionals are very um, loath to put numbers on it, except for me, because I'm one of those people, I say what I think and I've done my homework. So I can tell you that I can do your collaborative divorce for $32,000. If you play by my rules, if your wife plays by my rules, and if the um, uh, professionals are charging about this amount of money. And by the way, I can tell you that in part because of Bob Kokel, who's sitting right in front of me. Um, Bob and I work together on collecting information from maybe 12 or 14 different collaborative cases that were done here in, in Tampa. Um, is it, uh, is it a, um, uh, I forget the terminology, uh, is it a proven method for deciding how much these cases cost? Absolutely not. But in my experience and in Bob's experience, that's about what they will run. And that means, by the way, that I will only make $10,000 on your divorce. 
and uh, and Paul will only make ten thousand dollars on your divorce, and Bill will only make five thousand dollars on your divorce, and we don't have a uh, mental health professional in the room. We don't have a facilitator. She'll only make five thousand dollars. Okay. Um, so guess what, folks? Most trial attorneys aren't in favor of collaborative divorce because I will also share with you that if you come and you let me do your divorce the normal way, um, I'm probably going to make between 50 and 100 grand on your case. And the other side, by the way, is going to make between 50 and 100 grand, depending on who, who the lawyer is, depending on how high they, their hourly rates are. Um, and I'm about average. My hourly rate is fairly high because I'm old. My, my associate's hourly rate, well, okay, Yale played into that, yes. My associate's hourly rate is far lower, and I have her do all the grunt work. So, you know, if you blend the two rates, I'm not that high, and I'm still going to make a collaborative divorce. But I'm still going to make 100 grand in the trial. And by the way, that 100 grand, I like to tell people, that's to get to the courthouse steps. That doesn't count trial, the trial itself. It's just horribly expensive to get divorced. And by the way, I used to think that the reason I was so passionate about collaborative divorce was because I married a man who had custody of his daughter. And we spent 10 years in post-divorce litigation. He had custody. We started dating uh, two months after his trial. He still didn't have his final judgment. He got his final judgment in June. and. His ex-wife fired her attorney because she didn't win the custody battle and started doing the work herself. It's, it's really not hard to, to be a trial, a, a divorce lawyer. If you've been through the system for two years and you are a smart woman, she really did a great job at faking being a trial attorney. It, she made our lives hell. And by the way, this was in Miami, so we had to hire a lawyer down there. He charged $600 an hour. I'm an attorney. I could not afford this attorney. We had to make a, a deal. I paid him the same amount every month. It was a mortgage. It was a mortgage payment once a month for 10 years. So that's, it turns out that's not the real reason that I am so passionate about this because that was just, that was just money and it's done and it's fabulous and my husband is great and, you know, but I never saw my father again and that's, so many children go through that, and that's just not right. Okay, now I've lost track of which buttons I'm supposed to press. Um, so, neutral facilitator, licensed mental health of some kind. Okay, they referee the process, they lead the team. We talk on track. This is interesting. Um, we can be having a meeting, and one of the clients uh, melts, has a meltdown. What do we do? If we're a lawyer, what do we do? Okay, I will share with you that I apparently am one of those, you know, Paul, you don't remember me. No, you do remember. You, okay, I was never a touchy-feely gal. Never. I was, um, I'm probably because I never saw my father again. Wow. I just realized that. Um, I was never very touchy-feely. Not a huggy person. I moved to Tampa. People hug all the time. I'm like, oh gosh, where am I going to fit in here? Um, coming collaborative, maybe old age, I don't know. Um, it, it's changed my life. So I'm sitting in a room and years ago as a trial attorney, this would never have occurred to me. Cl my client dissolves in tears, she jumps up, she runs out of the office, she runs out of the conference room, runs out of the office, runs out of the building, she's out in the parking lot. And I run out after her and I hesitate and then I throw my arms around her and I just hug her. And I listen to what she's saying to me. And she says, he's not listening to me. And I said, trust the process. Come back in the room. We've been gone. The facilitator is talking to him. We'll go back in. Let's see what happens. Try again. We got the most fabulous reviews from her and her husband that I have yet to see in a collaborative divorce. She said, we learned to listen to each other again. We learned to communicate. I listened to him. I wasn't listening to him. She realized about herself. I had not been listening to him. And then he said, this is amazing. 
He said, I came out of my divorce a better person. Those are his words. So it's, it's truly amazing. But, but I just, I had done a little bit of what the facilitator is supposed to do. In, in Tampa, we usually only have one facilitator. In California, they believe in having two, two coaches, so that when one runs out of the room in tears, one coach can go with her and the other coach can stay with him. Um, and, I, and I get that, but that's more expensive. Makes it, of course, you know, California, they have more money. LA, all the celebrities, they're doing collaborative divorces. So we're problem solvers and educators, not so much adversaries. We're still advocates, absolutely advocates, absolutely. But um, sometimes we find ourselves, uh, so I'll tell you a story. Um, I, I shouldn't tell you a, an amazing person. When I found out that she was doing collaborative divorce, I thought, oh my god, that's so weird. Because she's, she's one of those, those female lawyers aggressive female lawyers, you're thinking of three different people and it's one of them. Um, so, I, so I run into, this is so strange, I run into the lawyer who was opposing me in the case in federal court that contributed to giving me diabetes. He was on the opposite side of that case and I run into him and he's been divorced now. 40 year marriage, gets divorced and he brags to me I had it done collaboratively and this lawyer represented me and he said, you know, it was the strangest, uh, he said this lawyer represented my wife. He said, it was the strangest thing. We were in a meeting and my wife is just not getting it. She doesn't get that there's not that much money in the pile. And her lawyer turns to her, puts her hand on her shoulder, so this is not a touchy-feely person, but still puts her hand on her shoulder and says, Sandy? I want you to think about what you're saying now. Do you really think you're being reasonable? She said this to her own client. And you know what? Her client took a deep breath and thought for a minute and said, you're right. Okay, let's rethink this. In the room, in front of her lawyer, his lawyer, the neutral CPA, and the neutral facilitator. And I can tell you, why that happened because I've had another client explain it to me. She said, when you have that team in the room with you, it's almost like having your family. They listen and you know that what you're saying is being heard by everyone in the room, not just your spouse. And so I will suggest to you that when her lawyer turned to her and said, do you really think you're being reasonable? She looked around the table and she saw that Everybody, everyone else was kind of thinking, and it's a team. So you've got that team support. And if the neutral CPA thinks that's not reasonable, then maybe you should rethink it. If your lawyer thinks maybe that's not reasonable, maybe you should rethink it. So it's, it's just a fascinating, fascinating um, process to watch take place. Um, collaborative is the um, legal agreement, so it's uh, essential that a lawyer be involved to advise each party on all matters of law. Um, we in the collaborative process kind of think that the law is not all that important. Uh, the law can be used as a stick sometimes. Uh, you know, do you really think you'll get $5,000 a month in alimony? A judge who doesn't know you or share your values or, you know, um, you're running a big risk there. Um, I had a client come into a collaborative case, Bob and I had a client come into a collaborative case and insist that she had to get $2,000 a month of alimony because she had consulted with a trial lawyer before she came to us. And the trial lawyer said, yeah, you'll get $2,000 a month alimony. How could he tell her that? You never know what a judge is going to do. You never know what's going to come out in court. A judge once told my husband, the judge mediator in his case said, well, we only see a snapshot of the process. Your lawyer thinks he's got this much to put on evidence, right? He gets to put on this much. We actually only hear this much, and we only remember this much. We only see a snapshot of your life, your case. And it's, it's very hard to make a decision based on such minute details. Um, so the financial neutral gathers information, provi provides guidance, and also helps create options for the parties. We come up with ideas they never thought of. We come up with ideas no judge would ever order. But 
if husband and wife think it's a great idea, guess what? That's in their agreement. And a judge will, um, will stand by that agreement as long as it's not illegal. So, easy example. Husband and wife agree that they're each going to split the cost of college. We're not, in Florida, we don't require parties, uh, parties to pay for college. No judge can order your, cl your client to pay for college. Won't happen. But they can agree to it, and a judge will enforce it. Um, they wrangle numbers, they create spreadsheets, and they educate. And then you've got the uh, facilitator, and, um, and then we have all the other possible. Um, this is the mo roadmap. So in theory, we go by this process. We have a series of meetings, and um, early on, the facilitator will establish the ground rules. We don't have to be there. That's another reason we save money. If you go to court, every single meeting you have with an expert, your lawyer is there. And you're paying the lawyer every minute the lawyer's sitting there. Because the lawyer wants to make sure that everything's being done correctly and he's aware of what's going on because he's going to have to know when he goes to court. In this process, I don't go with my clients. They meet with the facilitator. Good. Have a good time. I don't need to be there. She'll report back to me if there's something I need to know. You're meeting with the financial neutral, either by yourself or with your spouse. Fine. I don't need to be there. I have faith that financial guy is neutral. I know he is. I have faith in him. And he'll let me know if there's anything I need to know. So you save money. Plus, the, um, the other guy, the financial neutral and the facilitator, their hourly rates are lower than mine. Oh, plus... I'm not doing your financial affidavit for you. Why in heaven's name do the lawyers do the... Dina, you're smiling and they nodding. Yeah. Why do the lawyers do the financial affidavits? Yes, I was good at math. Does that qualify me to fill out your financial affidavit? Yes, sir. They take a hell of a lot of time. They do. They are just time-consuming beyond, beyond anything else in the and lawyers make mistakes. How many times have you had a financial affidavit come in front of you and you're looking at it and you go, okay, he spends this much on clothes, he spends this much on, uh, you know, car, he spends this much on gas, he spends this much, oh, and by the way, he's got five credit cards and he's making this much in monthly payments. Excuse me, those credit cards were paying for the food, the gas, the, you know, so now we're double dipping. Most lawyers don't realize that. I, I realized that early on because I'm brilliant. <laughs> Um, but the fact of the matter is that your financial is going to charge 200 250 an hour. I'm charging 450 an hour, guys. And it takes me longer to do a financial affidavit because I'm not as good at it. So you're saving money there. We've got to tell people this. They don't know it. They go to a lawyer. I went to a lawyer. I said, take care of this for me. I need a divorce. He said, fine, I'll take care of it. That's what we do as clients. We've got to clue them in. We've got to smarten them up. They got to know what their options are. Um, we talked about this. See? Oh my gosh. We talked about all this. Okay, so, um, so courthouse, more time, more money, more emotion, more stress, uh, poor results, broken relationships. I had, a, I had a client come to me and say, this was, a, I'm sorry, I had a prospective client come to me for legal advice. I got this subpoena. It's from my neighbor, but I'm not sure if it's the husband or wife. I have to go to court and testify. I don't want to go. I don't know who's going to end up living next to me for the next 10 years. <clears throat> he came and paid me for my legal advice because he was so frightened by the prospect of having to testify. Neighbors testify. Teachers get to testify. Uh, your CPA gets to testify. None of those people want to be involved in your divorce. They don't want to have to testify. They don't want to have to say bad things about you. They understand that getting divorced is very stressful and people do stupid things when they're getting divorced and that you're sorry now. But they've got to tell the judge about the time that you came to daycare and took your children without telling your wife you have to tell the judge that because they're telling the truth. It's, it's horrible. Um, so we, we fix all that with, uh, with the collaborative divorce. We protect relationships. We teach people to problem solve. We teach them to communicate. Um, we teach them to look beyond the divorce. I have had so many wives come to me and tell me, I didn't want the divorce. What am I going to do? I don't, I'm their, remember, I'm their advisor now. Yeah, I'm just a lawyer. But um, you, and I'm sure this happens to Dina, 
they, you're their advisor, they have faith in you, so they ask you these questions. They should be asking a facilitator, um, and if you're smart, you send them to someone who's mental health, but you know, we don't always do that. It's in the moment. How many times have I said, I'm not a psychologist? I, I used to say it three times a week. Now I say, you know what, I'm not the facilitator, call her. But I've told client after client after client, life will get better. It's the stress now. It will get better. Take my word for it. And they come back five years later. Oh my God, I love you. I love what you, you know, it, it's so, it is better, but they can't imagine it. In this process, we help them imagine it. We help them get there. Um, so this is all what we've already talked about. We talked about all of this. This is great. Um, and and I'm, I think I'm pretty nearly done. Do we have questions? Joan, what about privacy? So, okay, she's a shell. I, I planted her here to ask the right questions. So, yeah, I mean, there are a number of positives to the collaborative process. Privacy is a big one, and a lot of the celebrities know about collaborative divorce. The reason that you're not hearing about it is because they did it collaboratively so they could protect their information. So you go to court, and people don't realize this. Your financial affidavit is stuck in the court file. Is it sealed? Maybe, if your lawyer's smart, but, but Paul, you want to share what sealing means? And it still means, I've checked, it still means what it always meant. I don't know that you can seal the financial affidavit because there was a case years ago involving a guy named Dempsey Barron who used to be the uh, biggest political honcho in the state of Florida. He got divorced. He wanted to seal his financial affidavit. And he went all the way to Supreme Court and they said, no way. You know what? I wasn't aware that that was going to be your answer. It's a great answer. Um, here's the answer I was looking for, and I know you'll, I know you'll agree with this. First of all, judges uh, often will refuse to seal a file because you can't come up with a good enough reason. Second, even if they seal it, guess what sealing means? And I've shared this with my friend over there. They take a manila envelope, they stick the papers in the envelope, they lick the envelope, they stick it back in the file, they write sealed on it. They're still doing it that way. So now I'm your, I'm your kid. I just turned 17. I'm driving my own car. I get a bug up my butt. I run down to the courthouse. I get the court file. I look in it. There's a sealed envelope in there. I'm 17. You can't tell me what to do. I open it up. I look inside. And I see what dad said about mom, about what mom did 10 years ago. Horrible, horrible stuff. And we're not just talking about your kids. We're talking about the press. If you, you know, nobody cares about me. Um, but if you care about your reputation and someone in the office is out to get you, um, yeah, they go down to the courthouse, they can look in the court file, the press can look in the court file. It's all there. It's all there. You get divorced collaboratively, they still have to file in front of some of the judges the financial affidavits. Some of the judges will allow us to file what we call naked financial affidavits. Our financial affidavits say, yes, we exchange them. Wife has husband's original. Husband has wife's original. We've put them in safe places. And we are asking the court not to make us file the complete financial affidavit. So we don't put any numbers in them. I've had, the last few cases that I've had, I get the parties will waive the financial affidavit. Waive they, it? They know each other's stuff and they exchange everything. Well, you can waive. But you, they will waive the filing of it. Yeah, you can do it. Read Check the rule one of these days. <laughs> no, not one of these days. Uh, Ten minutes after I get back to my office. Okay. Both, part, both parties can agree to waive the financial affidavits filed. I've done a number of divorces, but no financial affidavits get filed. Oh, this is fantastic. Thank you all for inviting me. This is a very, very valuable piece of information. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so I have two, two clients. One is... I watch them from afar going into the abyss of going into a divorce. At first it's amicable, so each one is hiring a lawyer and da da da. The other one is it's just in the beginning stages of that. Of course they come to me and so on. My question is if someone is already in the path of the traditional divorce, can they append that and go to you? So um, I did not plant this question, um, but thank you so much. It's called, it's, called, it's called litigation freeze. We call it affectionately litigation freeze. Your trial lawyers aren't going to be happy. 
But the good news is that if you and you can convince your spouse uh, go to a collaborative, each of you go to a collaborative lawyer and agree to take a break from the litigation because you've realized now how expensive it's going to be. Um, you tell your attorneys, we're taking a break and if we can't settle it collaboratively then we're coming back to you. And actually quite often the attorneys are glad to see you take that break because they've really used up an awful lot of your money already and you're making them sick. Um, because they're at the point where, okay, uh, I've made enough money off this client, I really just want to be done. So, <laughs> litigation freeze. I'm, I'm being honest with you guys, and I'm recording this. I probably shouldn't be saying these things. <laughs> you can edit. Yeah, yeah, so okay. So that happens, I'm um, assuming that they haven't used all their retainer that has to be returned, the unused portion? Oh, sure. Well, some, some lawyers will fight you on that, but... Uh, Maybe. Okay. If it's a non-refundable retainer, you lose it. But by the time you're into it, quite often it's become refundable. Um, and by the way, I'll also share with you that if they refuse to return it and, and it's unreasonable to keep it, the Florida Bar will make them return it. So, yeah. We have a couple of uh, collaborative um, uh, practice groups in town. So you've got many options. Uh, one is the one that I belong in, nextgenerationdivorce.com. The other one is Tampa Bay Collaborative Divorce Group, T TBCDG we call it affectionately, those of us from Washington, D.C. who love not, uh, letters. Um, TBCDG, uh, you go to the website, it, it, both websites list the professionals. You can click on the professionals list and then you click on I want a lawyer or I want an MHP or I want a, an FP, a financial professional. Um, and you can just look through the list. You can search by zip code. So find a lawyer near you. I'm, I'm going through this because um, we've talked about all this, believe it or not. <laughs> I don't know why I bother with the PowerPoint, but there's some pictures at the end that are really important. Yes, Keithel. Um, I was going to ask, as far as financial assets go, is it easier to keep some of them intact in a collaborative process versus in court, or do judges and things like that? Well, you mean aside from spending all your money on your lawyers? Aside from spending, yeah. say you settled out of court, yeah. generally, I mean, is the goal to generally well, be collaborative? Or absolutely. Um, but keep in mind, uh, and, and I should add this just so that um, I don't misspeak, Collaborative is less expensive than going to court. It's pretty much more expensive than any other courtless alternative. So mediation, if you're a pro se party and you go to mediation without lawyers, that's going to be fairly inexpensive. Um, I'm a mediator and I, they'll run anywhere from 2500 to 5000 um, If you have lawyers and you mediate, you're probably well into litigation already and so you've already spent a lot more. But, but pro se mediation, cooperation. I called a lawyer one day. I said, this guy came to see me. We really want to do this collaboratively. He said, Jorn, these parties really don't have much money. Why don't we just sit down and cooperatively work it out? It was a two-hour divorce. We were done. Well, the interesting thing about this one, we get it done, and they agree uh, that they don't want to get divorced until January 1 for tax purposes. By the time January 1 rolled around, they had reconciled. Wife had this idea, she'd hit a certain age. She wanted to go live in, in New York with her kids. She spent six months in New York and by the time January 1 rolled around and I called to find out when they wanted to go to court, she said, oh no, I've moved back, I'm back in with my husband. We're fine. <laughs> okay, but you know what? If they had litigated, scorched earth, man. She would not have been able to pick up the phone and say, help me, never would have happened. So, yeah, so, um, <laughs> uh, I skip, you know, the not important stuff. There are the websites. My website is openpalmlaw.com. Um, I, brought a, I brought a couple of books if ever, anyone wants to buy one. They're 20 bucks each. They're storybooks. These books are intended for your clients. Some, you, I mean, a lot of you are first responders. You're the first to know that something's going on and maybe they've even asked you for a referral. Uh, give them a copy of my book. My book, War or Peace, the first chapter is about your alternatives, which the lawyers don't tell you. You can do it this way, you can do it this way, you can do it this way. You can sit at the kitchen table and work it out and then hire a lawyer just to write it up, whatever. Um, and then it's got stories about going to war or, or peace. 
And quite often, I have prospects stop by the office, pick up the book, they read the first couple of chapters before they come to the consult. By the time they come to see me, the first words out of their mouth are, tell me more about collaborative divorce. Okay? Protect your money, protect your relationships, protect your information, privacy. Um, it's really the best alternative. And we did all that. And these are the important things. This is my stepdaughter, five years old. She got rollerblades for her birthday. This is my stepdaughter, 25 years old. And this is my other daughter, who is, who is in the bag. Keep in mind the important things. Thank you all so much. I'm happy to um, answer questions still if you have them. Have I finished early? Nobody's moving. Let's see, you are actually seven minutes early. Wow. Ta da! <laughs> Seriously, any other questions? I'm happy to answer. Yes, sir. The collaborative process training program, could you elaborate on that? Later? Yeah, it's a two day introductory training. They're offered regularly around the country. Um, we have a number of qualified teams who train. There's one team out of Miami that's ex exceptionally good. There's one team called Lone Star in Texas that's fabulous, but they were just here two weeks ago. I chaired that training following in her footsteps. Um, we, uh, we have one in November in Fort Lauderdale. I'll be teaching part of it. Um, so all you have to do is, uh, you can look on the IACP website, International Academy of Collaborative Professionals. Um, if you happen to want to go to Las Vegas, and there happens to be a training there, that would be very convenient, I would think. Um, yeah, they're all over the country, you can find them. Right. local websites sometimes are posting right. training right. And they are posting maybe what's coming six months out. We have one here in Tampa once a year. So we just had uh, the, mo uh, the most recent one. We should have one next year. I'm not actually positive they're going to have one next year. But Miami, Gainesville, yeah. We may offer, actually, uh, I have a team that's training to train here in town. Adam Cordover's uh, put together a team. Are you, have you talked to him about that? No. Um, he will be doing a small training in Manatee and probably in Polk trying to reach out into those smaller communities that, um, that don't come to town if they can afford it, because you know what the big city's like. Yeah, it was supposed to be funny. Yes, sir. No, I, I think that most lawyers that have been around as long as you and I have really don't want to get real adversarial in, in divorce cases. I mean, we're going to be around forever, and the clients are going to be gone. I mean, I like to try to keep families together and remind people that they've got children, that you just, if you're getting divorced, you're not really getting divorced. You're just going to be living in separate places and paying twice as much to do all these things. I talk about my ex-wife, and people look at me strangely. I have an ex-wife. She was married to my husband, but yeah. I mean, you don't really get divorced if you have kids. Now, if you never had any children or anything like that, and you're relatively young, 20 years old, you made a mistake, you go your separate ways, you'll never see each other again. But when you have kids, you don't get divorced. That divorce only cost me $250. When I yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, mine, mine actually cost 20 grand. The only one. <laughs> no, don't, don't, don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I was always a trial lawyer. I was known as, as that aggressive female trial lawyer. I got the fastest verdict in Hillsborough County. I got a six and a half minute jury trial verdict. The jury came back in, it was a DUI. Jury came back in and the bailiff thought they were there to ask a question and they had a guilty verdict. And that was, I was the prosecutor, so that was, that was a good deal for me. Um, you know, tr uh, trial work, uh, there's a place for trial work. There's absolutely a place for trial work. But let me share with you that collaborative isn't just divorces. It's, um, it's paternities, of course. It's prenups. How do you like asking someone for a prenup? Um, the stories that you hear, I mean, I've been very blessed in the prenups that I've handled. The, the parties were very congenial and they took deep breaths and they, they you know, were careful. But if you have a facilitator in the room to help with that, oh my God, how much better is that? We talk about interests, we don't talk about positions. In, in court, you're talking about positions, and, and that's what's so um, difficult for people at first to understand. I want the house. 
I'm the wife. I stayed at home. I deserve this house. My kids have their own bedrooms here. I now have a home office here because I'm starting to try and work. You want me to work, don't you? So I want the house. I want the house. Wait a second, wait a second. I'm the facilitator. What do you really want? You want security? You want space for a home office? You want space for bedrooms for the kids? You want, what is it that you really are looking for? What's your interest? Oh, well, gosh, there's a house the next block over, same neighborhood, same school system, and it's pretty much the same size, and gosh, it got foreclosed on last year. It's a lot cheaper if you buy it now than, than the house you're in. Let's sell the house you're in, you know, so, or let husband have it. Yes, sir? Two things, uh, prenups and relocation. I find prenups almost obscene because you're doing the divorce before the marriage. Oh my God. It's, <laughs> it's disgusting and it's obscene. And uh, I don't. It doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be, but it, you know, you're doing the divorce and just divvying up all the toys and everything before you even say I do. And then the relocation thing is. Uh, like you mentioned earlier, years ago, whoever wanted to take the kids can just pick up and leave before you even file a petition. Well, today, you cannot do that. They finally come out with some rules and statutes and stuff like that, that if you have kids, they're almost forcing you to live within a manageable geographic area so that Nobody can leave. I mean, you have but, to have but, one hell of a good reason. Paul, let me, let me share with you that if you go to trial um, and you've been through that uh, war from the get-go, um, most of the time you want to leave town because you just want to get away from that other party. And I'm going to suggest to you that if you get collaboratively divorced, your desire for a relocation is going to be much smaller. On the other hand, a prenup, if I can just be another hand, I was hired for a, a prenup plan that they, this couple's been together eight years, but there's a 28 year, a 20 year age difference, and he's extremely wealthy. And the lawyer representing the wife just wanted to see what ifs, because he wants her to travel with him, and she makes a very good income, over $200,000 a year, but where she gave all of that, and all the retirement that she's doing, all the planning that she's doing, oh, I give all that up to go be with you more often, what does that look like? Yeah. And there was a prenup that they were doing, and she needed those five scenarios that were created. I don't, there's a, this was divorce planning prior to the four. So sometimes it is very helpful. Yeah. This is a, a current case. Yeah. And collaborative, not just for families. This collaborative. And this was a right. But, but collaboratives for partnership dissolutions, for small subchapter S dissolutions, family family, business dissolutions, bankruptcy cases. Bankruptcy judges are very interested in getting collaborative into their, into their courtrooms because of all of the relationship disputes rather than it's not just about the money and the collaborative can help with that. Yes, ma'am. How do you determine who you work with pro bono versus the normal, more traditional clients? I decide if I like them or not. <laughs> um, we, uh, you know, it's kind of funny because um, it's taken me a long time in my life to realize that um, we have all these institutions and somebody started them sometime and made the rules. Um, and so three and a half years ago I said, you know what, we need to get collaborative out into the community and I think that a really good way to do that is to work for free. And also we have collaborative professionals who've been trained now but the word's not out there and they're looking for cases, so hey, maybe they'll work for free <laughs> to get some experience. And then they're not saying to their client, yeah, this will be my first case. No, that, that wouldn't happen. So we have a number of reasons to support a pro bono project, and I just sat down and I decided. Um, I went to Bay Area Legal Services, had a terrifically hard time getting them to refer us cases because they didn't understand. Um, you know, I'd call and say, well, why didn't you send us this case? And they go, well, they can't agree on anything. Okay, right. Um, or, uh, you know, there was domestic violence. Well, you know, it depends on what kind of domestic violence because any, yelling at someone is domestic violence these days. So we can, we can deal with that. That's why we have a facilitator in the room. Um, 
So, uh, so working with the legal ag agencies can be tough. Bay Area has sent us some cases, but it's like pulling teeth, literally like pulling teeth. Um, we've been very blessed that they now send out case summaries to the lawyers, because I'll look through the case summaries and I'll call and say, I want this one. And then, that, then I'll have a specific argument with somebody. No, you can't have it because, or whatever. We have gone over there and done some trainings, but Bay Area does intake with volunteers, so they always have new volunteers coming through. Now, Gulf Coast, which I sat down with three months ago, has already sent us three cases. They have uh, attorneys who work inside their process, and they're there every day, and if they can't take a case, they'll think first, hmm, I wonder if Jorn's Pro Bono Project can take th this case. So we're doing a case in Manatee uh, that we got through Bay Area. Bay, um, sorry, Legal Aid, um, Gulf Coast. Gulf Coast covers Bradenton, Sarasota, uh, Pinellas, and Hillsborough. And I don't know that TBCDG is in all those counties, but Next Generation Divorce has professionals in all of those counties who are looking for cases. Yes, sir. Maybe I'm just not paying attention, but it would seem to me that it would be uh, good for the message to get out a little bit better collaborative is not just for divorce. Uh, that's all I... We just started a civil collaborative group, so they'll be working on that. Um, but in the pro bono project, my clients sign a press release. So I actually got a lot of press by doing the first um, pro bono collaborative divorce in the state of Florida. Was that really a big deal? But, but I said it was a big deal and the press listened to me. So I was on Bay News 9, I, w I was in all of the newspapers. Um, I don't remember where else, but we had, we had national press. Okay, good for us. And the clients signed those releases because as I explained it to them, look, we're gonna give you free financial advice. We're gonna give you free uh, facilitative advice. We're going to give you free legal advice. You're getting free collaborative services and all we want back from you is permission to use your story and uh, maybe an interview with, with someone if they want to interview you. And people have been bending over backwards. And I also ask them, and if you're satisfied, go out in the community and tell people. Tell them. Yes, sir. One last thing. Most of these people have heard about mediation and the fact that if they're in a divorce case, they're going to get referred to mediation sooner or later. So you might want to talk about how you distinguish mediation from the collaborative process. Because yeah. Mediation People think it's the same. Later. People think mediation is the same. And if you, if you don't understand how mediation works, you would not know, you know, yes, it's a courtless alternative. A mediator, uh, in a mediation, the two parties just meet with a neutral third party who can be a lawyer, a financial neutral, or a mental health person. Um, the mediator does not give legal advice in theory, um, although sometimes they kind of steer. I happen to be a mediator and I know how it works. Um, but mediation is therefore a lot less costly. But mediation does not address the real interests that are underlying your positions. Um, so parties can mediate if they're fairly congenial with each other. They can come to a deal. In collaborative, we actually teach them we teach them to problem solve. We teach them to communicate. We teach them to co-parent going forward. So they do come out with added skills to the repertoire. And that's why I'm convinced that if you get divorced collaboratively in your first marriage, you probably will not get divorced in your second marriage or your, th <laughs> or your third marriage. <laughs> Listen, I had, dinner, I had dinner on Thursday night with my 83-year-old uh, con law professor from, from law school. And um, he's on his fifth fiance, um, and and not and not because he didn't love his wives, he um, he outlived them all. So, so I didn't mean anything by saying third third marriage. Thank you for thank you. Thank you.